welcome to our webinar for the online MSc in Sport and Exercise Science and Medicine. Joining me here today is your uh, Academic Programme Director Stuart Gray, um, Dr Stuart Gray rather I should say, and your Programme Administrator Lindsay Ross. So both will be on hand to answer any questions for you and we've also got the Q&A um, button at the bottom there. If you just hit that then you'll be able to type in what questions you've got. But at the end we'll be able to answer any questions for you as well as some pre-recorded or pre um ask questions that we'll be asking. If, if you want to just go ahead Stuart and um, let everyone know what your programme's about. Certainly Michelle, thanks very much Michelle. So yeah I'll just give an overview of the courses that you can take during the MSc in Sport and Exercise Science and Medicine, the, the online version. Most people do the course over three years, some people have done it shorter, some people have done it in two years, some people have done it a little bit longer up to five years uh, but most people pick over take over three years so the general structure we have set out is for three years but we can kind of change this a little bit if you want to do it over a shorter or longer time but what I'm outlining, outlining here is the way it works for three years the courses are the same regardless how you do it but uh, just when you do them would be different so first year of the the course you do the the core courses the courses that you you don't have any option in they're the ones that we 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 make you do and there are five courses you do in the first year you've got medical statistics which everybody loves uh, i'm sure john mcclure won't mind me saying that everyone loves stats but it's something that's very important for science i think it's something undervalued in science something that we all need to do and we need to do better in science there's another course that's called evidence-based medicine, which is all about how you design a research proposal, how you evaluate research studies, uh, and what's the strongest design, what's the weakest design, all that kind of thing about designing research and evaluating research. Then we've got three courses that are laboratory-based courses. Uh, so practical courses, which is tricky online. Uh, and they are, oh, they've got very long names, First one's physiological and exercise testing one, aerobic and physical activity. Aerobic fitness and physical activity, I think is the full title. And in that one, we look at how you, different ways that you measure cardiorespiratory fitness. So VO2 max and physical activity, different ways to measure that. Second one is physiological and exercise testing two. And I can't remember the title of that. And, and exercise intensity domains, where we look at things like lactate threshold, critical power, different ways of measuring these things uh, and how we can demarcate low, moderate, high intensity exercise, how we can evaluate that. And in the third, it's called human physiological and metabolic assessment. And that we're looking at metabolism. So carbohydrate and fat metabolism, how we can measure them during exercise and how these are modulated by ingesting carbohydrate during exercise and at rest. Uh, and we do some blood sampling in there. So obviously online, you're not doing the practical stuff during the year. Uh, we've got the videos of how you do these techniques online and we give you the data and you do the data analysis all online. And then for each of those, there's little bits of group work throughout the course, but the main assessment for each one is you write up a scientific lab report, like a, like a paper that you would see published in a journal uh, as the assessment for them. And then for the actual hands-on stuff at the end of the first year, what we do is we get everyone to Glasgow in June for a week and we do the actual techniques so you get the hands-on experience still of running all the tests that we show you on the videos so you'll have seen the videos you'll have understood the principles underlying the tests. you'll have analyzed the data for all the tests you'll have submitted all your assignments for the tests but you've just not done the hands-on stuff so that's what the the weekend class going june's for that we we do that so so that's the first year medical statistics evidence-based medicine and the three lab courses. And what we do is each week, we release a different block of material from each course. And we do them kind of in alternating order. So we do one week of the lab course, one week of statistics, one week of evidence-based medicine. And then we do lab course, statistics, evidence-based medicine. So you've got a different, uh, different course each week in the first year. And we mostly do that because you need to do a bit of the stats and research methods before you can do the lab courses because you need to understand how to evaluate the research and it helps with the write-up. So, but we felt that if we gave you all the stats at once and all the evidence-based medicine at once and no exercise stuff, people would get a wee bit 
board of that. So we kind of mix it up week on week in first year. The second year is when you have your optional courses. So you get to pick three courses. Uh, on the website, it's, it's nine. We're, we're possibly going to change these a little bit uh, from how they are currently on the website in future years. Uh, so, so the options might slightly change. Most of them will still be the same and, w and when they run might be slightly different because what we do is we split the the year into the three semesters. So you've got from September till Christmas time till December. And then you've got January till kind of spring break, Easter time uh, in March, April. And then the third term is kind of near the end of April up to the end of June. And then in the first term, you pick an X option, we've called it. Second term, you pick a Y option. And third term, you pick a Z option. And in those ones, the we're not alternating week on week. It is you're doing 10 weeks of your X option, and then you've got a break. Then you do your 10 weeks of your Y option, and then you get the break. And then you do your 10 weeks of your Z option. So currently, what we're looking at for next year, and this is probably slightly different the way the options run, uh, that, that's currently on the website, and this is still to be confirmed, is in your X options, we've got a course called Ergogenic Aids for Exercise Performance. <clears throat> and in that course, we're looking at mostly nutrition, uh, but we're also looking at different other physical aids, things like blood flow restriction, these kind of things. Anything that can aid in exercise performance, particularly looking at strength, uh, strength training in that that course. So that's one of the X options. The other two X options are exercise and clinical populations, which is looking at exercise prescription in people with diabetes, people with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, cardiac rehab, these kind of these kind of populations. And then the third X option is SEM in practice, sport and exercise medicine in practice, which is more looking at if you're working with a big team or a team in the run-up to, say, the Commonwealth Games, how do you look at doping control? How do you avoid people getting infections and coming down sick before the team? What are the logistics of it? These kind of things. So it's more how do you work within a sport and exercise medicine environment, actually in a practical, applied sense with a, with a team. And these two courses and all our clinical courses are run by Dr. John McLean and Dr. Katie Stewart who work out of Hamden. Uh, John McLean's the team doctor for the Scottish football team, and he has been for quite a few years and runs all our, uh, runs all our clinical courses. So he's an experienced clinician uh, that looks after the clinical side of things for us. And he's also a WADA doping person. And I think he was the chief medical officer for the Commonwealth Games when it was in Scotland. So he's got a lot of experience of working in these environments. So he kind of uh, runs all that side of things. So that's the X options. The Y options we have are physical activity and health, biological mechanisms course, which is run by Jason Gill, and that's looking at how is physical activity good for you? What is the evidence that actually tells us that physical exercise, physical activity is good for us? What does it do to the heart? What does it do to how we handle lipids? What does it do to blood pressure? How does it work, basically? Uh, why is it good for us? What are the mechanisms underlying that? So that's all covered in that course. And then we've got two sports injuries courses, which partially run together. Uh, sports injuries for docs and physios and sports injuries scientific basis. The kind of first half of the courses are share the same material, where it's, it's looking at the kind of prevalence of injuries and types of injuries and these kind of things. The courses then diverge a little bit where the, the sports injuries for docs and physios look at more evaluating and treating an injury. So somebody has a shoulder, we get the specialist shoulder consultant in and they talk about how you evaluate the shoulder and what the treatments would be. Whereas in the scientific basis, it's more looking at it from a sports science point of view. Uh, and it is, so the clinicians has said, the person has this injury, I've advised this treatment, but then how do we get that person ready to play sport again? How do we get them rehabbed and ready to play sport? And also how do we prevent them from getting injuries as well in the first place with proper strength and conditioning? Because within the kind of sport and exercise medicine environment, that's generally the role a sports scientist would 
would take uh, rather than diagnosing injuries it's more how we can help people get back return to play after injuries so that's the three y options uh, z options are physical activity and health public health and policy which is more kind of follows on from the mechanisms course so we know physical activity is good for you we know why it's good for you now if we've taken that other course but how do we get people to do it and that's what this course is all about how do we actually get people to do exercise everyone knows it's good for you getting people to do it is not an easy thing to do so that's kind of looking at ways in which we can do that within that course world-class athlete is the other z option and that is again it's kind of quite broad there's a bit of nutrition there's a bit of athlete preparation and again kind of similar to some of the clinical courses where we get the experts and shoulders in here we've got a lot of people coming from institutes of sport and who work in elite sport giving the lectures of how they actually work with an elite team what do they do with a football team from a nutrition point of view prior to a game how do they help them with recovery uh, so we got all these guest speakers in doing that how do we do strength and conditioning for our endurance athletes all these kind of things are covered in that world-class athlete module and the final option is one called cellular and molecular exercise physiology and it's looking at the kind of deep down to the cell level so again we know exercise is good for you we know it say it causes left ventricular hypertrophy it makes your heart get a little bit bigger so it can pump greater volume of blood but within those cardiomyocytes the actual muscle cell within the heart what is happening what is signaling that cell to grow What's causing that to happen? Same with the skeletal muscle. What makes it get bigger? What are the cellular mechanisms that actually uh, cause that to happen? And they are all kind of covered in that course. So that's your option courses. You pick one in each term, one X option, one Y option, and one Z option. And as I said, the order they run in might change ever so slightly from the way they are just now. And we might tweak, take away and add courses uh, but the bulk of them will, will be the same. Uh, but we are kind of reviewing that just now to try and make sure we've got the best courses we have on there. So that's your second year done. Third year is the project. It's the dissertation project. And this can take lots of different forms depending on the student's circumstances. We've got some people will do systematic or narrative literature reviews where they're interested in a topic. Uh, I'm trying to think what my students are doing this year. Uh, so one of my students is looking at the instance of brain injuries in martial art contact sports. So she's kind of done a systematic review looking at that. Uh, one of my other students has been looking at water sports and how to measure uh, training intensity during water sports. And they've done a kind of narrative review on on that so that's kind of one way you can do it topic of your interest and you can do the literature research you can write a review based on that some people are lucky enough they maybe work within a sporting environment or they work with a team or they work within an environment where they've got access to people and data and they can run a study so some people do run experimental studies uh, kind of remotely you'd still have a glasgow supervisor obviously one of my students this year for example works in a local college that's not it's not local to me it's local to her uh, a college and they were looking to do a study looking at kind of home-based interval training and how that improved health unfortunately then the covid pandemic came along and that completely stopped it so she did a literature review in the end but that was the plan uh, so we can we can facilitate those kind of studies other studies people can do are data analysis so it might be we have got access to things like UK Biobank data and we can give students access and we can show you how to run the kind of stats and run the numbers on these to answer a whole variety of different questions. Other students have also, I had a, one of our MSC students was an anaesthetist and she ran the kind of pre-op exercise testing in her hospital and she had collected a lot of data and other people had over several years so she'd accessed a big data set of exercise testing from the from her hospital and we were able to do some data analysis from that data uh, so it can be it can be very varied uh, and the other thing actually one of our students did this year was we can do i was going to call it a social media project and i can't think of the name 
uh, an outreach type project a science communication project and she's put together infographics around the exercise during pregnancy to try and get over the commonly held misconception that you shouldn't exercise if you're pregnant you should just stop doing things uh, that actually exercise encourages and obviously there's constraints within there but she's produced this very nice video infographic that kind of is currently looked at being used by some of the kind of pregnancy associations they uh, are taking it on to, to give out on social media so we've got that kind of aspect as well so it works it's all very individual depending on your circumstances and interests but the third year is the project and that runs all the way through to the end of the third year and then that's you kind of done so so that's the three years and there's the one visit to Glasgow in the June of the first year which sadly didn't happen this year uh, so the students that missed it this year are going to going to just come they'll come at the end of the second year but that's a one-off for everybody else it will be at the end of your first year uh, that you come come for the for the week so that's probably enough of me talking that's an overview of the course and i will cease my chatter and answer some questions if there are any some questions that were emailed into us then, um, specifically from the students, obviously, that have uh, joined today. Um, we have, um, so how many hours per week are estimated for the course? And if possible, can they be broken down into sort of reading, lectures, classes, assignments, etc.? What, what are you expecting people to yeah. allocate to uh, themselves? So probably about 50 hours a week. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, I'm sure that's what they all do anyway. No, normally the, what we do, the material we release each week, so we release different material each week and it's probably about, it does vary slightly week on week, it's probably around two to three hours of material that you have to watch uh, depending on the course. So there's probably about say two hours of lecture material sometimes it's not a lecture you're watching but it's maybe a video of how to run a view to max test then there's probably for some courses there are tasks like again the practical courses there's you need to then do the analysis of the data for the more lecture based it's go and do the reading based on that so there's then this other the other reading or analysis of data which are kind of put into one we're probably expecting you to take that up to it's probably another five to ten hours a week we're really looking at it is and then then you've you're building up to your assignments at the start there's probably not much doing the assignments at the at the end that probably comes up to four or five hours a week as the kind of courses progress because it's a, so it's a full-time course so we are it's not a full-time course it's a part-time course uh broken down over three years Then maybe you'd be able to help with this. Yeah. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Um, so, how and when will um, students be able to get access to Moodle? Well, the term starts in September, end of September, isn't it, Stuart? So, they should have access prior to that. Um, I've not got definite dates from the digital team, but um, as soon as they're enrolled onto um, their courses, their choice courses, then they should automatically be enrolled onto Moodle. So once they complete the application process, yeah. Is there any support available for hard of hearing, um, sight disabilities, dyslexia, anything like that? What's, what's accessible for students for that? I'm sure the digital team have got things in place, haven't they, sure? Um, the, I mean, for dyslexia and other things like that, the usual yeah. University of Glasgow support services are all there yeah. for that. For the videos, we most of them now have all got transcripts i think there's a few of the digital team are still working on so there's transcripts available for all, all these kind of things and the materials all there and on middle and all the different formats it can be downloaded it can be watched live it can be uh, there's a there's written form as well as video form visual form so we've hopefully got everything in place to cover cover all those bases yeah 
Yeah, and sorry for the interruption. So what I was saying in my previous one was it's as a part-time course over three, three years. So normally we expect a full-time about 35 hours. So over the, we split that into three, it's about 15 hours a week. 10 to 15 hours a week would be what we would expect people to do on the MSC. Broken down roughly to two hours watching stuff, eight to 10 hours reading, doing some extra stuff, reading or data analysis, and then another three, four hours prepping for the assessment. In reality, I know that students as on campus <laughs> don't do all that. Uh, that. That's kind of ideal world. And we've set it up as well. So, because I know some people have weeks that are busier than others, that it's flexible and that we, it's all asynchronous and that there's nothing live. You don't have to log in to watch a live lecture. It's all on there that you can watch when you want. You can download it onto your phone and watch it on the train into your work. Uh, if you've got a really busy week and it's not a week where there's an assignment due, you can keep that week and you can watch it the next week. And you can. Some people have said that they build up the material and then they pretty much do it 30 hours in one week and then the, the other week they only do one or two. So we tried to make it as flexible as possible because we know people have busy lives and busy jobs as well. Throughout the year or just at the end of the year? So there's, there is assignments throughout the year. So mostly the assignments come at the end of the, the modules. Uh, we've got some little group tasks throughout uh, that maybe make up in the lab courses, they make up 15 to 20% of the marks and they're just small submissions kind of dotted throughout. They're not a massive effort and a lot of their actually, they're designed to try and get people to work in groups and get to know the other members of the class. But the kind of main assignments for each module generally comes one to two weeks after the module ends and and that's often at the, the end of the term. So you're looking at the kind of just before Christmas, December time, you'll probably have some assignments end of March, beginning of April, you'll have some assignments due and kind of end of June, you'll have assignments due. So that's the kind of three main points where there's going to be, there's going to be assignments due. So you mentioned group work as well. So what kind of group work is required then if it's all online based? So we try and get, so it's all online, but there's things like we ask in the lab courses students to work in groups to put together little wiki articles on things like lactate threshold testing, just brief one page wiki articles. And it's mostly, again, it's it's to try and get people, half the fun of going to university is you get to meet other people and you get to chat to them. So we're trying to recreate that where possible through discussion forums online. We're also thinking about using Microsoft Teams, which is becoming quite useful for this kind of discussion uh, between groups. In reality, what generally happens is we assign people these groups and they chat a little bit on the forums and then they all create a WhatsApp group on the phones and they go and do it externally via WhatsApp, which is completely fine. Uh, so yeah, that, that kind of uh, group work that, that we ask them to do. And it, it works well. The students say they do, do enjoy it. With the caveats of there's always the odd person that doesn't contribute and stuff like that. But. Or anything? What uh, have you got any recommendations for any books that people should buy, or any journals that they should read? So the each course has its own reading list, which is all digitised, and it's all students will not be able to see it though until they get access to the middle site. So once they once they can see the middle sites, see all the reading lists, and all the journal articles are on there. We primarily at MSc level and being kind of research said but there's primarily journal articles we we do use uh, and there's a lot of them so i couldn't give any recommendations just now but there's lots on there but for people that haven't done sport or science before sometimes a textbook something like there's things like mccardo catch and catch exercise physiology textbooks there's some and there's some other basic exercise physiology textbooks which aren't a bad thing for students who maybe haven't studied sports science before coming into the course if they've done physio or if they've done medicine and they've, they've got the physiology background but it's just the kind of exercise slant just to get them a bit familiar with that that kind of thing's not a bad a bad thing to do okay. um, that's it for any um, more questions 
on my list here that there are a few attendees that we have, but um, I'm waiting to see if anyone now, uh, would you like to answer, um, ask any questions, anyone that's attending? Yep. Oh, something's <laughs> did, uh, did you see that pop up? Um, yes. COVID-19 dependent, is it an opportunity for work experience? So yes, actually, that's a good question. Uh, and that's something that I mean to say I should have said with with the, this, the, the third year project. The option I forgot to mention for the third year project is the internship. We often have we have the option to do internships, and it can be a little bit more challenging for the online, depending on where people are. But on campus, for example, we've got links locally with Rangers, Celtic, the local rugby teams, uh, lots of local sports clubs where for the students' projects, they can they can do it within the sporting environment so they get the experience of working in uh, elite sport. And then they normally collect some sort of data as part of that, like a sports scientist would normally, and they write that up as a, as a project. So we can still facilitate that with the online course and we have done before we had students in malta who we managed to organize placements with football teams and there have been a, a few other examples as well but it kind of depends where the person is uh, and if we have any links to sporting clubs or anything in that area that we can facilitate something but it's something we can definitely try to do but it would be locality dependent Normally, it's not too hard to do, to be honest, because most clubs and most sporting environments are happy to have a free helping pair of hands to get work experience. So we can normally facilitate that, yeah. Are there any other questions for our attendees? If you have any queries, questions, you should be able to contact uh, Lindsay Ross if you go to the website and find the Sport and Exercise Science and Medicine webpage for um, postgraduate taught uh, master's programmes and the email address should be at the top of the page there. So uh, thank you all for attending, um, panellists and attendees, and have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye now. Cheers. Bye, Bye for now.